well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Welcome to another edition of Bearing Arms, Cam and Company. My name is Cam Edwards. Uh, Obviously, today we're going to be talking about the shooting in Monterey Park, California, uh, and a potential second shooting site where the uh, suspect apparently... Uh, was uh, thwarted from carrying out his attack thanks to a a citizen who uh, wrestled with the uh, suspect and managed to get his gun away. Uh, Joining us on today's Bearing Arms Cam and Company, a California gun owner, Second Amendment advocate, uh, founding board member of the Asian Pacific American Gun Owners Association, a competitive shooting champion, Chris Ching, uh, is with us to talk about the shooting, which actually happened not far from where uh, Chris grew up, as well as... Uh, the expected reaction from California lawmakers going after you know, legal gun owners as opposed to uh, putting the focus where it should be, criminal justice and mental health. Take a look and a listen. Chris, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's good talking with you today. Yeah, thanks for having me on today, Cam. It's a very tragic and sad day. It, it is. Uh, and, you know, I, I let me just ask you, I mean, first of all, just an open-ended question. I mean, when you woke up to the news – uh, you know, this, uh, horrific attack. Um, and then as we learn more information, I mean, what were your first thoughts? Yeah, you know, my first thoughts are, you know, Monterey Park is very close to where I grew up in Southern California. And just to imagine the amount of fear and confusion, and now I'm sure d- distress and, and probably some anger, right? That's going to come in the aftermath of, of the shooting is, um, it's just heartbreaking, you know, and then, especially in the early days or the early hours actually of this uh, mass shooting being reported, it wasn't known the if this was a hate crime. You know, so that was definitely one of the first thoughts in my mind is just wondering, oh, gosh, like, is this yet another hate crime against Asian Americans? Um, you know, at least at the outset, you know, it was another, um, you know, the, the shooter was Asian male. Um, so hypothetically, you know, probably not an anti-Asian hate crime. Um, but yeah, it's just, just really just sad and tragic and, um, yeah. And, and just, you know, the, the timing of this shooting as well, the fact that it was on Lunar New Year, which is a, it's, it's a celebration that cuts across multiple Asian cultures and it's a celebration. It's a time where right family and friends get together. And so the fact that this, the shooting happened on Lunar New Year, it just heightens the level of uh, of emotions and and tragedy uh that's involved so it, it's just it's just heartbreaking it, it it is and you know as we're learning more um about the uh, the suspect we still don't know you know the motivation i've seen uh, uh you know anonymous law enforcement sources uh, indicating that perhaps uh the suspect was looking for his wife um and, you know which which would indicate some familiarity with these locations and and maybe even some familiarity with the people inside right um, this might not have been a case of targeting strangers. This might have been, you know, uh, a, a, an attack targeting acquaintances, targeting even friends. We, again, we don't know all of the circumstances here, but we do know that this was a, a horrific tragedy. Um, and as you say, people, I think, are, are rightfully angry. I mean, some of the stuff that's already emerged, we know that this guy apparently went to the police a couple of weeks ago and was complaining that maybe he thought he was being poisoned. Um I don't know about you, Chris. I mean, that 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 maybe is, you know, worth police investigating and maybe they come to the conclusion, OK, he's not being poisoned. Maybe this gentleman needs some help. Maybe he needs to talk to somebody. Maybe we need to take him in on a 5150 hold in California and, and see if, you know, he's in a mental health crisis. What, what, we don't know if that was done, um, but it, at this point, it doesn't sound like there was any sort of, uh, you know, involuntary commitment or anything of that nature. Right. And and I think uh, one thing that's been interesting to me is that he was a known quantity to this dance studio community. Right. This wasn't a random stranger. Right. Who was coming into to the to the place of business to, you know, just, you know, uh, innocently uh, or, you know, just like target random people. This sounded like he was embedded in the community. People knew who he was. I've been reading some uh, witnesses and community members commenting how he was acting a little strange, right? He's just sort of a uh, little, little strange acting over the past few weeks and months. And, and yeah, I just, I wonder, you know, if there were warning signs and, you know, I think 
uh, it, it's hard, I think, to, to, to pick out these small moments in somebody's life. And right, somebody might say something strange or act strangely in a different way. But, you know, in a vacuum, you might just look at, at, at someone saying, oh, right, I think I'm being poisoned. And you might say, well, you know, hey, that's a weird thing. But right, the hard part is, that, at what point does that escalate into a 5150 or to say, hey, you know, we need to get this person medical help. Um, that's, I think that's the hardest, um, that, that's, that's sort of the, the edge of, of this challenge for our country and, and just for our communities to be able to know how to identify when somebody is on that edge and, and then how do you get people help? Absolutely. And, you know, and to that end, I mean, I think, uh, you know, one of the things we're, we're, we're already going to see this in California, they've already uh, introduced bills to expand the use of red flag laws. And, you know, because I don't know if you and I have ever talked about red flag laws, but one of the issues for me beyond the due process concerns is that there is no mental health component to them. Uh, you know, a judge says, well, based on the evidence that a prosecutor's presented to me, yeah, it looks like this person's a danger to themselves or others, take their guns away, and then the problem is solved. And clearly, I don't think that that's the issue here, right? We're talking about dangerous individuals, not about one particular item that they might own. How concerned are you? living in California, that the legislative response to Monterey Park is going to focus on guns and gun owners and not on things like mental health. Yeah, it's it's the California legislature and our governor are definitely going to be focusing on anti-gun measures in response to this shooting. It's it's just it's the classic playbook of the anti-gunners here in California that you know, the, it's this um, ill-advised focus on trying to take away guns from innocent Americans. Now, it's one thing, hey, like if we're trying to right, target individuals who have mental health issues or obviously if they're felons, like that's a different category. But, you know, anti-gunners here in California, they just like to paint all of us gun owners, right, including the responsible ones. They like painting us as the bad guys or as the potential threats. And so, um, but you know, here's the funny thing, Cam, is that California has some of the quote, strongest gun control laws in the country. So where do we go from here, right? It's like, we already have so many gun control you know, laws on the books. And it's, it goes back to the, you know, the, we, you know, we know that most gun control, like it's just, it's just ineffective. It's not gonna keep our country safe. And so, right, the the ultimate path here is the government's probably going to try and, you know, get to some confiscation scheme. I mean, that's I, I know that's um, uh, for non-California residents, right, that may sound like we would never get there. But right, in states like California, right, New Jersey, Illinois, I mean, we are on this path, right? It's, it's a slow whittling and chipping away of our Second Amendment rights. And so what I hope will happen is, you know, the Asian American community is strong and resilient and also less prone to using emotions as a part of decision making processes. And so what I'm hopeful is that the Asian American community is going to give some very clear thought right, to what this problem was right, and how to solve it. And the problem here is not the guns. right? The guns aren't what caused the guy to go commit crimes. Right. We need to focus on, again, it's the mental health aspect, you know, the, and, and also, you know, this whole, you know, death by suicide, um, you know, uh, component. It's, um, you know, it'll be interesting to learn more um, as, as information comes about. Right. Was this just ultimately, you know, death by suicide, death by cop, you know, kind of kind of um, play here. And, you know, the suicide angle is one where. You know, our country, thankfully, is providing a lot more suicide prevention resources, right? There's the new hotline 988, right? It's mm -hmm. the equivalent of 911, but 988 is a new national hotline for suicide prevention. So that is a new, that is a channel, right, for citizens like you and me to say, hey, you know, I have someone who I know who I think I need some guidance, right? How do I have this conversation or how do I divert you know, or direct resources, mental health resources towards someone in my community who needs them? So 988, um, I hope, uh, is another focus, right, in the aftermath of this tragic shooting. Well, you know, and, and what you just talked about is something I think that's really important because it's a, look, you know, Congress may have uh, passed the law to establish 988, but ultimately what you're talking about 
is something that's deeper than legislation, right? We're not looking to Sacramento to solve this problem. We're not looking to Washington, D.C. to fix this, that we're we're looking at our own lives and, and how we interact with the people around us. Um, and, you know, I go back to this. I, I referenced this before. The Secret Service did a, a study on active school shooters a few years ago, and they found that 90 percent of these school shooters communicated their threats beforehand to somebody, right? Whether it was family, friends, they posted something on social media, but they said something. And that tells me, Chris, that if if we are looking out for the people in our lives, if we are, you know, taking the time to notice, hey, that person seems to be struggling. Um, let me let me go talk to them. Let me see how they're doing. Let me reach out. I haven't spoken to this person in a couple of weeks. I just want to see how they are. You know, it's not our responsibility on the one hand to prevent these types of attacks by, you know, peering at our neighbors and our friends and, you know, examining them with a microscope. But I think if we are maybe a little bit more cognizant of the people around us and we are interested in in making sure that they're doing OK and hopefully folks are interested in making sure we're doing OK, that maybe we can identify these individuals and get them help before they commit these atrocities, right? I mean, that mm. that's the ideal answer here. Absolutely, and right. So it's all about, like you said, it's about looking inward, right? At, at the individual level, right? It's, it's asking, hey, if, if I'm part of this, you know, whatever community, you know, if I see someone in trouble, like, what can I do, right? It's not what can the government do, what can mental health professionals do, right? It has to be, what can I do right now with this person who needs help? And the, you know, when it comes to firearms in particular, right? so this is, you know, this is where, you know, if you actually know someone, right, really well, right, you're likely to, if they have firearms, you're likely to know that they have firearms, right? If this is someone that you know, you know, as a friend or someone in your community. And so if somebody is in mental distress, right, and having, uh, you know, a challenging period in their lives, you know, one option, you know, one of many options that we have is to offer to temporarily take custodianship, right, of that person's guns and just ask and say, hey, you know, just as a, as a friend, as a favor, you know, if you're open to it, you know, I'm willing to, you know, temporarily hold your firearms, right, while you, you know, go through this tough part in your life. Um, and so this is where, you know, gun control laws can actually get in the way of that. You know, for example, you know, here in California, uh, I can temporarily loan a firearm to a friend or a family member, but only for 30 days. Right. And then if it's longer than 30 days, then we're actually supposed to go to an FFL, right, a gun shop, a gun store and actually do a formal transfer. Right. And formally transfer those firearms right to to me, for example, if I'm taking custod temporary custodianship mm -hmm. that costs money. Right. There's there's the processing time. There's there's delays that are baked into that transfer process. And so this is where, you know, gun control laws, you know, uh, as uh, you know, well intentioned as some of the anti gunners are. Right? They don't always realize that they have this negative real world consequences right on good americans who are trying to do the right thing right trying to keep ourselves safe trying to keep others safe and trying to keep our community safe and healthy as well absolutely well, listen chris i know we're going to be talking uh, a lot more this year um, i'm going to be calling on you to uh, give us your reaction to some of the gun control bills that are uh, floating around in sacramento um, but in the meantime, you know, let, let's talk about what you're doing uh, uh, real quick, because you are obviously so busy with, you know, competitive shooting with your segment and activism. Um, what, what are you focusing on, uh, you know, over the next uh, few weeks or few months here? Yeah. So, uh, you know, uh, I co-founded a, uh, a, a, a gun organization that's focused on Asian Americans and it's called Asian American, Asian Pacific American Gun Owners Association, or APA GOA. And APA GOA, you know, our core mission is about firearm safety and education. And over the past few years, we've seen a notable 43% increase in Asian American gun ownership, right? And so you've got, a, this is a, a historical shift in, in gun ownership demographics. And so, you know, as you and I know, as gun owners, right, you can't just buy a gun and then expect to be safe, right? You, you need to go train. You need to be educated on how to uh, not just operate the firearm, but, you know, understand the ethics and the, the legal 
components, right? Of, you know, if you end up, you know, shooting somebody, you know, what are, what are the local laws, right? In your jurisdiction, what's going to happen to you, right? So there's all these consequences um, that, that can come about. And so APA GOA is all about creating community, right? And connecting firearm owners or people who are interested in, in, in shooting and uh, making sure, right, that they have the information to be safe. And so with the shooting in Monterey Park, um, you know, APA GOA, right, we, we are one of many resources available to, uh, to the Monterey Park community, to other Asians, you know, throughout the country. And, you know, we, we want to, again, like we want to help educate Asian Pacific Americans on uh, sports shooting, on self-defense, right, home defense, concealed carry, um, right? And how, how do you go about, right, getting your CCW, right? What is the right kind of, uh, you know, pistol, right, or, or, or firearm, right, for you given your particular situation? And so in the wake of the Monterey Park shooting, um, you know, I'm, I'm sure we're going to see an increase in interest in APA GOA. Um, so, you know, I'm on the uh, founding board. Uh, you know, founding you know, member of APA GOA. And so if, if anybody's interested in more information, we have a website and, uh, you know, social media presence, APAGOA.org. All right. Chris Chang, thank you as always, sir, for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again very soon. Thanks as always, Cam. I appreciate Chris joining us on the program and looking forward to having him back again very, very soon. Uh, now let's turn our attention to today's Armed Citizen story, our good deed of the day and our recidivist report. Now, our armed citizen story and our recidivist report, actually, same story. Here's the headline from CWB Chicago. Arrested 32 times since 2014, man allegedly engaged in a firefight with a concealed carry holder on a Chicago Transit Authority train. Now, that concealed carry holder not arrested, even though CTA does ban concealed carry for most people. But as it turns out, this would-be robber picked the one guy on that train, who was probably lawfully carrying. This is a a security guard. Uh, And according to the CTA policy, while concealed carry is banned, there is an exception for security personnel who are traveling to and from work. And that was the case. A 25-year-old bank security guard who was off duty, just headed home, uh, was the victim of an armed robber. Uh, And the armed robber pointed a gun at him, took his belongings, told the guy, get off of the next stop. He did. That's when he drew his firearm, which the robber apparently hadn't discovered, went back onto the train and started shooting at the uh, robbery suspect, eventually uh, injuring him. Uh, As it turns out, Darius Moss, the robbery suspect, no stranger to law enforcement, 32 arrests, as that headline uh, noted, since 2014, four felony convictions over that same time period as well. But uh, Darius Moss, apparently little to no time behind bars to show for the four felony convictions and the 28 other arrests, um, some of which, at least, may have ended in uh, misdemeanor convictions or who knows, perhaps there are even other felonies out there. Uh, He didn't care about the law forbidding him from bringing a gun on the train. Uh, But again, thankfully, he had the uh, misfortune of choosing probably the only lawfully armed citizen on that uh, Green Line train car when he uh, engaged in the robbery. The uh, robbery victim, by the way, uninjured, uh, and again, not facing any charges. There is a lawsuit underway, by the way, taking on the uh, gun-free zone designation for all Chicago Transit trains, buses, and uh, bus and train stops. And hopefully, that lawsuit is going to be successful because clearly, again, violent criminals don't care about that prohibition. It's only legal gun owners law-abiding citizens, those who want to protect themselves, not only on the mean streets of Chicago, but above them on the elevated train as well, who are uh, harmed by these gun-free zones. Finally today, our uh, good deed of the day in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Let's go back to uh, California. You know, uh, as Chris and I were talking, there wasn't just, there were actually two locations where the suspect actually showed up. First, at that uh, uh, ballroom in uh, Monterey Park, where he was successfully carried out his assault. And then he apparently went to a second location in nearby Alhambra, California. And as he walked in, one of the uh, patrons there saw him, 
heard the sound of the gun apparently being racked and thought, okay, I have to step up and I have to do something. And grabbed the man, struggled for the gun, uh, eventually was able to get a hold of that firearm. First time that uh, Brandon Say has ever touched a gun, by the way. He said, my first thought was I was going to die here. This is it. He spoke to uh, Good Morning America, telling his story, saying, when I got the courage, I lunged at him with both my hands, grabbed the weapon. We had a struggle. Uh, Say said he was hitting me across the face, especially in the back of my head. I was trying to use my elbows to separate the gun away from him, create some distance. Finally, at one point, I was able to pull the gun away from him. And that moment, he said it was primal instinct. I didn't know what came over me. He uh, then pointed the gun at the suspect and said, get the hell out of here. I'll shoot. Get away. Go. Say said that uh, for a moment, the man stood there as if to ponder whether or not to uh, charge Say again and then turned and left the facility. Uh, Say's actions saving uh, countless lives again in the right place at the right time, willing and able to do the right thing. Uh, Brandon Say, we thank you for your life saving. Good deed there in Alhambra, California. And that is going to do it for this edition of Bearing Arms Cam and Company. We will be back with you tomorrow with uh, even more of the latest Second Amendment news and information from all across the nation, including perhaps a uh, another look at what uh, gun control activists are uh, doing there in the uh, Golden State. Until then, I would encourage you to check out BearingArms.com throughout the day. We've got you covered there as well on all of the important Second Amendment news and information. Gun control bills on the move in Virginia today. We've got uh, several other armed citizen stories that we're focusing on as well. And if you like what you see, I'd encourage you to become a VIP member. All you have to do, go to BearingArms.com slash subscribe. Use the promo code GUNRIGHTS, and you can get a significant savings on your VIP membership. As our way of saying thanks for showing your support, we're going to give you exclusive content, news stories, analysis you won't find anywhere else because your support does matter, and it really does make a difference. So thank you again. All right, have a good rest of your Monday. We'll see you back here tomorrow. Until then, be well, be safe, be free.